for our final session today before Jonathan Isle um, winds things up and draws the threads together. Delighted to welcome John Bew from, from number 10. Um, and I happen to know that John has come to us having just had a meeting with the Prime Minister and knowing what Prime Ministerial and Senior Number 10 staffer diaries are like. Um, I am hugely grateful to John for giving up um, some of his afternoon to speak to this conference today. And I think that is a measure of the importance which this agenda is being given by uh, people right at the top of the present government. So John, why don't we, we start by just me inviting you to um, say a few things to us um and also uh, we're treating everything in this, uh, because the audience is big we tend to treat everything as pretty much on on as on the record rather than sort of lead to any misunderstandings um and i think that um you know, what people i think would be quite um uh you know keen to to hear from you and to 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 understand is um, you know, what do we mean but by, by um uh, actually having you know, what are the opportunities you see ahead? What are the um, what are the objectives that the government has in mind? How will the government measure success or failure when it terms it comes to delivering uh, its objectives on uh, national security skills? Uh, John, you're muted still. It, you just need to unmute. That's that. Let's try again. No, it, we still have a problem. I'm sorry about this. It's uh, there seems to be a tech. Seems it's. I think it's a technical problem on the cabinet office side. We're trying with headphones. Oh, Is that better? That's it. Perfect. We're there. Excellent. We're there. Thank you. Um, the first most important aspect of national security community, of course, is basic IT skills, which I'm afraid I, I lack. Um, but thank you to my colleague, uh, Pamela in the Cabinet Office, who very hastily opened the link door um, and, and, and let one of the wolves from number 10 um, into the building. So um, apologies for the delay and, and thank you for that very kind introduction. And hello to um, all my um, colleagues and, and friends and uh, collaborators over many years, who I can see on this call and, and spoke earlier over the course of the day from from ministers through to um, mentors in the case of um, uh, Laurie Friedman and others. So uh, it's great to, to have a group of people back together again who are um, similarly like minded in all recognizing and understanding and understanding the importance of strategic thinking and strategy, even if we have different interpretations of what that might be in practice. Um, I thought, um, David, I'd, I'd uh, dutifully dodge a bit of your question and, and talk a bit through um, the, the, the role of national security skills and some of the strategic thinking that went into the integrated review and then get into answering it um, in the second uh, part of my comments. Um, um, the, 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 the first thing to say is, and I, I, it wasn't just a kind of uh, attempt to warm the room up or, or flatter those in the call, is, is that, you know, from, from Elizabeth, whose work on resilience was very influential um, um, on, on thinking on the integrated review, um, uh, through to Laurie's many books, um, through to the essays that um, Malcolm Chalmers wrote on things like the rules of international system. Um, I could go on and on, and I'm sure I'm, I'm forgetting people. Um, that was all, these were all unquestionably um, tributaries that flowed into um, our assessment um, and our work. And I'd add to that as well, and unfortunately I missed Peter Ricketts comments earlier, the combination of those who have had frontline experience of diplomacy and the business of national security um, um, with those who've had more time to, to, to sit and sit and think. And I, I talked about coming through the link door between um, number 10 and the cabinet office, but, but the best link door we could possibly have is between the world of think tanks and academia and back into government again. And I, I think that's a, that's a good thing. And it's something that uh, on the way out, um, uh, Peter and others like Mark Lyle Grant have, have sort of pioneered in coming to, to King's and, and teaching on courses. Uh, and it should be open in the way in as well. And Laurie Friedman's done it for many years. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm a recent example of it. And I, I, I just simply say that my, my remarks are all organized around the idea that we need more of that and that is healthy for our national strategic discourse and it's healthy also for our international credibility and i'll talk about what i what i uh, mean by that 
Um, now, in terms of the integrated review, we, we basically used a, um, at one stage, we thought of having a, um, footnotes in the documents. And the footnotes maybe are in, in um, the longer, never to be published versions. It may make some boring historian very excited uh, one day when they go through them. But, but it, what, what it shows is that essentially we had a balance in terms of the um, information that we took in between the assessments, official assessments of different arms of the state, um, right up, if you like, to the apex, which is the Joint Intelligence um, um, Committee, um, from um, uh, different parts of government, from um, the Defence Academy, um, whose work in futures are very important, to the Foreign Office planners, who were, I think, um, did not expect the sort of love bombing I gave them in my first few weeks in this job, because I'm uh, obsessed and very interested in, in Foreign Office planners. Um, they're rather horrified by the fact they were getting calls um, from from number ten. Uh, no, I think they were delighted. Um, but 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 so so we, we we drew on sort of resource and assessments from the risk register to the um, um, the various uh, assessments of British interests and changing British interests to horizon scanning and surveys uh, and, and assess that and, and, and number crunched it where possible or made qualitative judgments in around that as much as possible in terms of our assessment of the strategic setting. Um, and that, by the way, showed that, that some of our assumptions about the strategic setting were, were long overdue change and uh, an assessment. And then on top of that, we, I think, in this review may, made, and I, I can't sort of compare it to, to previous reviews, but we made a virtue and, and a bit of a thing of bringing in as much external evidence uh, and in some cases challenge um, as we possibly could. Um, so the very small team that I assembled in number 10 um, which had the advantage of, of proximity to power, had the advantage of being a number 10. Um, and I think it's important that, 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 that those who, whose job it is to do the thinking um, aren't tucked away um, too far away from those whose job it is to do the doing. Uh, and again, that's my, kind of my second headline observation, that the thinking and the doing, um, you need to be symbiotic activities and they're not, they're not always symbiotic activities. Um, um, so first is open door, second is think thinkers and doers need to be close. But that small team was basically assembled of a, of a mix of people, mainly either com um, um, coming out of um, different forms of military service um, or um, um, from the kind of think tank uh, parliamentary world. Um, I think I was the only special advisor, or there was a, there was a, for a short period, a super forecaster, which that, that, the, the story of that is covered um, uh, very extensively in the, in the media. Um, but that, that sort of reflected a, a desire to have a kind of plurality of methods and, and, and approaches um, with a mixture of people who have direct, direct frontline experience um, and the mixture of those who's had a chance to sort of think more effectively about things. And one of the probably the most important person we brought in um, externally was um, uh, someone who's a committee specialist in the House of Commons. And another thing we really wanted to do is not just sort of acknowledge the um, uh, importance of politicians or politics, but acknowledge the importance of, of thinking that went in into the House of Lords and House of Commons and the various reports that were done. Uh, and in fact, I was quite surprised, really, and I hate to say that in front of learned lords and parliamentarians if they're on the call, is actually having done a bit of work in support of, uh, as a specialist in, in support of the Foreign Relations, uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, um, that, that, that some of the, the, the sharper end and really good pieces of analysis, and I think of some of the, the Joint Committee of National Security Strategy reports, weren't really fully imbibed and listened to in government. People don't have enough time. Um, and particularly when things come out of the Lords, they did so in a such an excruciatingly pol polite and genteel way um, that in a very busy week, um, it's quite hard for people to imbibe or, or, or take on board what were serious suggestions and pieces of analysis. So we wanted to use those kind of given pre-existing resources. Um, we made a big virtue of using as much as we could um, from the think tank community and the academic community. Uh, and, and definitely we learned lessons over the course of that process. So I think with the academic community, often that involvement uh, and that engagement has to be quite targeted. Um, there's a great thing that academics do, particularly at academic conferences or an academic reading list, which is to find as much possible balance as possible in terms of um, assembling a group of people to opine on a subject. Uh, you want maximum balance across the political spectrum. I think in general, focusing on diversity and plurality of thought and challenge is a good thing. But I think in the business of government, you've actually got to choose. You've got to choose, and I think it is a political judgment in some cases, or strategic judgment, who you think is added value, uh, who you think is important. So some of our academic engagement was very, very targeted. And we were able to target in such a way that we were able to use on, on, on two occasions quite significant chunks of the Prime, Ministerial, Prime Minister's diary 
to discuss um, high level and important issues uh, when we were able to identify the, the right people to discuss those subjects. Um, in terms of think tanks, Again, certainly in terms of rollout of the integrated review, some of it, I must confess, uh, think tank engagement can be performative. It can be about um, 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 uh, trying to avoid as many um, bows and ar uh, arrows and, and other receptacles uh, thro thrown, at the, uh, thrown at the integrated review. So some of it was sort of um, stakeholder management, uh, as you will, but other, others was, was really quite, quite useful and important. And so we, we have a habit, uh, there's a small group of us who would wait for the freshest and sharpest report um, and do internal assessments of the, uh, the freshest and sharpest reports and ping those reports from think tanks in and around different point parts of the system for responses. Um, and, and that was another kind of major major part of what we, what, what we wanted to do in terms of the process. Um, so, so the mixture of thinkers and doers, I think, is important. And it, it's actually encapsulated. I, I get both um, credit and blame um, um, as the kind of uh, the most obvious outsider expert or insider outsider involved in the review. And, and uh, I'm happy to take as much of that as possible. Um, all the bits, all the good bits in the review, of course, are mine. Uh, and all the bits I disagree with are parts of the sort of painful, slow and cumbersome white hole process. Um, uh, just, just to establish that. But the, really the key, the key um, two figures in terms of penning the review, there are many, many uh, soldiers and heroes who went under the red, uh, under the radar and, and really pushed the envelope on a range of issues from artificial intelligence, particularly science and technology. Uh, and they are still fighting that noble fight. Um, 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 but, but in terms of holding the pen, the, 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 the two key people involved in that really encapsulated that balance of inside um, um, it, it, inside out. Um, I should probably should, I should, I'm not sure if I should or shouldn't mention their names in, on an open line, but we had someone from uh, Parliament as a as a specialist um, who had a think tank background, um, who basically made it their job to not involve themselves in the process, but to do the thinking and the writing and the uh, assessment of language, etc. And on on the uh, Foreign Office slash Cabinet Office side, we had someone who had uh, a number of years of um, frontline diplomacy in in some some of the you know the the, the biggest diplomatic relationships, but also the the toughest security. Uh, base postings, um, and that combination of those two individuals, um, um, uh, 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 two uh, young female um, rising stars in national security, encapsulated what we tried to do do do, uh, do, do with the review, um, and I, I think you know are responsible for all the good things in it. So that was that was how it worked at, at sort of maximum process. And the other things to throw in to this, and I'm sure Laurie Friedman's reflected on this in, 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 other, in, in, in different ways as well over the course of his remarks, and I've heard him um, um, say it many times, if he's used the Mike Tyson uh, analogy of strategy is all very fine until you get punched in the mouth. Um, but forgive me for uh, mentioning it again. Um, uh, but we were punched in the mouth many times during the process, and that kind of had to be bit, um, uh, um, um, accepted a, 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 as part of the strategy making process. I think the key thing is to make a virtue by being punched in the mouth uh, as much as possible. Um, what you can't have is a, is a, is a hyper academic or a, an overly post political, uh, such a professionalized national security environment uh, that it can't, um, is, is too impervious to outside trends of opinion. It's too impervious to outside pressure. Uh, and I think this kind of goes to the heart of the, of the, of the British dilemma on, on national security. I had also have the privilege of, of um, being part of the NATO reflections process. And one thing that's very, very striking is how from around the world, people think the Brits do it best in terms of the business of diplomacy and national security, because we're highly professionalized, we're highly expert, we're used to presenting, we're used to conveying ideas, uh, and we have a lot of um, kudos for that. And I think that preserving that is absolutely fundamental and vital. And these sort of massive swings you get um, in, in US foreign policy on, on quadrennial or, or, or um, um, eight year cycles don't, don't um, necessarily um, um, always support stability or, or institutional knowledge or, or continuity of knowledge. I think that is absolutely vital and must be preserved. At the same time, um, there is no question we could be a little bit more open in terms of receptiveness to ideas, challenge, uh, intellectual curiosity, um, following of debates and ideas and arguments. Um, and we could incentivize um, the acquisition of knowledge and the willingness to challenge a little bit more um, in, the, in, in the process as well. I mean, the Whitehall is necessarily and importantly very hierarchical, but it often means, as I say, the, do the doers um, uh, are not the thinkers 
Um, and I don't think we need to be an e either a doer or a thinker, or at least I think the thinkers need to be close enough um, to the levers of power uh, that, that they're providing um, swift thinking rather than um, uh, percolated, tucked away, back of a filing cabinet versions of, 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 of depth of knowledge. Uh, and I think that balance could be shifted a little bit. I was really struck with the review how uh, when we entered the phase of engagement with allies and partners in terms of the details of it, when you looked across the table, particularly with European and American partners, uh, but also I'd say that with um, um, uh, Japanese, Australian, the, essentially the UK's natural partners, you were often met over the other side of the table with academics, um, with think, think tankers who come in and out of government service, often sitting around a table of six or seven with practitioners at the same time. So others, allies and partners do this naturally more frequently and more often. Um, and I think it's necessary. Um, um, I think at, at moments of, of uh, there's certain moments in history in which um, experience and, uh, 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 and practitioners must always and should prevail. Um, but there are other moments in history in which ideas are in flux, in which um, the, the, the um, sort of strategic assumptions, the underlying assumptions which undergird our approach or the language you use about the world needs refreshing and it needs challenge. And it is also a matter of credibility. And, and, and this, this is, I've been I've kept my remarks, you know, hugely positive thus far. And it, it absolutely reflects my experience with the excellence of the, of, of the British government in many of these areas. But I was struck at the start how uh, we often used um, tired phrases or imprecise language about important things. Uh, and that is part of our diplomatic verbiage and that is part of our credibility with allies. So, you know, uh, without, <laughs> without naming names, um, the notion of this, often the sort of waves of American strategic debate hit, hit British shores about three or four years late. Uh, and the danger is always we kind of, we drink the Kool-Aid um, just as the Americans move on to the next big thing. Um, so, for example, in our in our in our paper in, our, in the review, we're very careful not to sort of drink the Kool Aid of great power competition. So the lo same logic doesn't fully apply um, to us. Uh, and actually, we have a more textured, you know, rainbow-like focus on, on different areas of national security, from resilience to transnational challenges to those state-based threats. Um, so it's not about hedging; it is about recognizing that one's interests and challenges are, are, are different. But notions like the Thucydides trap. We're sort of bumbling around in rooms long after their their sell by date. Forgive me, forgive me, Graham Allison. Um, and often at the highest levels, or we would talk about wanting or not wanting strategic competition, not knowing how that landed in certain contexts, in conversations with the Australians or the Americans um, or others as well. So, so that ability to be able to test um, ideas in and out of government, um, to know what was, one was saying when they were saying when they're talking about the difference between a real space international order or a real space international system it sounds like semantics it sounds overly academic um but it's not i think it's important uh, it's about credibility um and then the final thing to say is, is you know uh, across all of that um i've talked about um diversity of thought um and i think diversity of, of thought is vital and 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 plurality of thought i can also th also think and there, there are many examples of this where um, um, subject matter expertise, simple subject matter expertise. Um, the amount of times uh, in a room of decision makers when, when you want the person who knows the most about X or Y to test your un ungoverned assumptions uh, and to give you that intellectual discipline, I think that could be um, uh, brought into to, to, to government a little bit more effectively. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the obvious example of that is, is um, um, you know, a country subject matter expertise or region subject matter expertise or linguistic expertise. Um, and again, uh, a lot of excellent work has been done at the Foreign Office in to kind of uh, revive um, some of that. Um, frankly, there, there are, you know, the generalists are prized over the subject matter expertise in our current system for, for good reasons and bad. Um, um, but but um, uh, secondarily, I think, in, in particularly, there are areas where there are knowledge gaps. Uh, and we're like wanting to sign like um, uh, a certain former special advisor who's been in the news a lot um, um, recently, that one of the areas of knowledge um, which is more and more vital to, to national security is, is science and technology and different areas of that. And that's very clear. clear. Um, and, 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 you know, the, uh, one, one answer is for people to be more knowledgeable about, about, about those different areas of national security. Um, um, across the board. Um, another answer is to be able to work more effectively with academia, uh, private sector, uh, again and again. And by the way, academics are not easy to work with, um, and they're not always the answer. Um, I must say that as well. Um, 
um, and I think others, others others will recognize that. And I'll just I'll just say something very very final as a, as a um, and finally get to the question that, that David asked me about about implementation. We have we have lots of um, I was looking again at integrated review before I um, joined this call, and we have lots of um, very determined and and, and uh, strong proclamations about the importance of implementation, they, and they really are vital. And some excellent work is going on across Whitehall. I mean, really really sharp work on on business plans and and, and KPIs. Um, uh, and targets and goals and campaigns um, um, uh, that, 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 that really does actually support that. Um, and, and I urge those in, in the Joint Committee for National Security Strategy and others to, 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 to dig a bit deeper because there's been some excellent supporting work. Um, but one of the things I think w which is vital and which we could do, and I'm not sure I want to give it, give it a name, but it's something we are thinking about and working on, is to have a, a better strategy brain and strategy function right in the heart of government right in the very center which supports those uh, minute by minute decisions wherever the expertise is grounded there it didn't house it all areas of expertise but it, but it should be more effectively plugged into the to the different pockets of expertise around different parts of government and while well, it should always know who to call it should always know for example on open source who the the key expert is on on, on x or y subject uh, and sometimes that that's quite slow uh, to the rise to the top it should always know a week before a new think tank report that argues for a new allied technology uh, base. It should always know what that means for the United Kingdom and what it means for the United Kingdom's allies. Um, and that sort of, call it a strategy function or a policy planning brain, or I prefer to call it, you know, some sort of strategic advantage um, function, I think I think, I think think is absolutely vital. Um, and, and again, is, is, is something that our friends and partners and allies have and shouldn't, shouldn't um, um, uh, be, be too much of a challenge to, to emulate. I, I will I will stop there, no doubt, having hopelessly failed to answer David's questions, but deliberately so. Thank you. John, thank you very much indeed. Stimulating as I, I would have expected it to be. Can I take you straight up on, 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 on your final point um, and the suggestion of a sort of, if you like, a, a, a policy planning function being established in the centre of government? Um, and I'm, I mean, like you, I've, I've sort of I find find the role of the planners in the foreign office very interesting and 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 very creative in, in general over the years um but isn't one of the big challenges for government going to be how to change the culture in the way you advocate and to institutionalize those changes when every department will have an inbuilt tendency towards groupthink and when departments because of budgetary constraints have in general been cutting back on the, the the sort of posts which involve engaging with external audiences because then those are not dealing if you like with the core frontline uh responsibilities of a of a department and, and, and do you think that the, this challenge is best handled by the government and treasury basically saying to departments well, each of you needs to have a policy planning uh, function to challenge orthodox wisdom, to talk to uh, think tanks and outsiders and look at international examples? Or is this something that you think is uh, realistically best handled from the centre? And if the latter, how do you balance that against this, the, the pressures for multiple different crises that are always bearing in on number 10 and, and, and senior people? In number ten, actually, to, to enable this culture change to be sustained. Um, so I think I think it's I, I think the, the the answer can only be partly institutional. Um, as a tendency, I've seen it in my short period in government, and I don't want to sign like some sort of um, um, you know um, wizened expert who, who's who's been in government for many for many many years. Um, the tendency is sort of always to try and find an institutional answer with another flow chart. Um, and um, uh, a set of slides which help correct the problem. I think you adverted to it in your second part of your comment. Uh, I mean, part of it is a matter of, of, of culture um, and incentives. I mean, the, Whitehall and, and different parts of um, uh, different departments and, and the many, many um, um, uh, servants of the British state who serve overseas in different parts of the world, it, full of expertise and knowledge and depth and uh, subject matter expertise um, um, for some reason <laughs> often gets sort of 
the, the, the sausage gets made in such a way that it's rather very bland by the time it comes to the center. <laughs> um, um, so, I mean, there's got to be a way of sort of reaching down. And, uh, and one of the things we did in the Jew review was just to, to reach down with a kind of um, like one of those hands in a, an, a, at the, uh, I've just come back from this, a nice weekend at the seaside. So one of those claws that come down to try and pick up teddy bears uh, in different parts of the system. Often we drop a teddy bear on the way back up. Um, but, but you know, that, that was kind of inevitable. So you have to go and find the expertise. You have to know wh where um, uh, the expertise is. And I'm, I'm thinking, and I'm, not, I'm very much not going to name names. Some of the people in the school will, will know that sometimes can be a frustrating experience um, because the different departments are quite hierarchical. Um, uh, ministers are un understandably a bit cautious about um, having different parts of government. So, so, so the, the hierarchy and the structures and, and, and the kind of firewalls between those different different areas is, is one of the, the difficulties. Um, but take it, secondly, and it, uh, as to the cultural point, um, I mean, you've got to. I think you've got to be celebrated if you're if you're reading foreign affairs every week or you're sharing online articles or you know those important things. That, that, that there shouldn't be distractions from business, and that, that's quite hard to, to get to. But I, I don't know how you get to it. But it wouldn't have been that uncommon in different periods of history, having read all those boring planners' files and the foreign office files and having been writing a book on this before I came into government, that you would have people with really bright ideas often, you know, charging around like a bumblebee trapped in a in a glass jar, but occasionally getting out and and influencing things. Um, I mean, that is part of the process. Um, uh, and, and as a historian, I, I think we're at a moment when the world is changing in such a, a, a different way, when different types of expertise are required, um, when we've been through a political revolution uh, in many respects and, and an upsetting of, of, of you know, certain assumed um, trajectories for UK foreign policy and UK politics, that you just, you just need that, that curiosity uh, and you need that sort of expansive, um, more expansive um um you know set of sources and ideas and incentives um and then just a final th thing to say about it, I mean, it, ha it also has to be sharp edged it can't it can't it can't be academic um you have to be on a mission um your mission needn't be destructive um but you have to be on a mission to convey something um uh to change something um it has to have political will behind it um uh, and, and it's not just sort of about you know Getting, getting the purest academic processes into government. Um, often purest academic processes are, are very boring and not that helpful. Um, and it's not always about sort of changing institutions and structures. It, it, it's, it's about cultural, it's about living up to the moment, it's about political will. Um, I, I think that those are as vital as, any, as anything else. Um, but you know, expertise is, is, comes in different types of forms. I think that's what I'm essentially trying to say from that uh, practitioner expertise. Um, um, you know, the amount of, times that you know former senior ministers or officials would say well why don't you listen to me or or you should you should make more use of, of formal uh, um, uh, th those the former expertise um I, I that's also a good challenge as well so it comes in, in many different forms from from the you know the young tech startup version of of fresh thinking expertise um through to the you know the, the former pus or nsa uh it's just about you know valuing those different expertise expertise but being responsible when you're in government for deploying it effectively I'm afraid we may have lost uh, our chair uh, for this occasion. So David, you're on mute, uh, if you can come back. I'm sorry, I'm there, my fault. Um, yeah, question here from Ewan Grant. Um, without naming or identifying anybody, how have you and your colleagues found organizations responding to serious criticisms? You know, are there any patterns as to where people have been positive in response to criticism or circumstances in which organizations or individuals have been have been negative and I say not not ask you to name anybody in particular sorry David I didn't quite um, get the question could could you could you yeah so I yeah I think it's when I'm switching screens that, that one, one thing freezes question from you and Grant saying that um, you know how have you found people and organizations in their response to sometimes serious criticisms I mean not asking you to name anybody but um, are there patterns, you know, circumstances in which you find, yeah, in the, these circs, people respond positively, but in these circs, it's been more of a negative and sort of resistant 
response to criticism. Do, do you mean sort of criticism of integrated review or inside or outside government? Or... No, more, more, more about where the, either the process of preparing the review or the response to the handling of particular crises has led to criticism of how a particular department or agency or whatever is is handling its responsibilities um uh okay um i mean the the the, the first thing to say is that most most of it's actually really good news i mean i, I yeah, i'm so, so. um you know really impact impressed and, and and heartened by two things that are on that are on the integrated review um the the the, the first is the extent um to which um, essentially the many professionals in different parts of the state just wanted uh, a clear text on the table that would allow them to go forth and implement uh, and the skill and commitment to doing that uh, and the reporting back on that and, and the target objectives in that is, is extremely heartening about delivery. Um, so and that, that's, that's the first big takeaway. The second is a slightly uh, a different point, which is that actually it's it's um, provided a kind of almost the, the, the perfect plank to different strategic conversations with allies and partners uh, in the sense who are also yearning uh, and going through the sense of um, the need to, to reassess some strategic assumptions and, uh, uh, and patterns and, and very interested in, in how we did it and what we do. So that's the kind of the, 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 the first thing. Second thing to say is, I mean, this has been, you know, because of the pandemic and, 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 and different periods, because of the first of all, the domestic political crisis um, up to and including um, the 2019 general election um, and and thereafter almost immediately uh, the pandemic you will have you will have and I, it's not for me to comment on uh, mercifully this is not a select committee hearing um, uh, you will have heard sort of you know criticisms and versions of that and I, I probably you know shouldn't and, and 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 can't add to them I mean so you know crises always I think um, you know, um, sometimes show a machine, either show a machine functioning to maximum effectiveness, or they show a um, uh, the problems with the machine. Um, uh, and I think you know, there's not, there's been less, frankly, been less foreign policy. Um, if you exclude Brexit from the foreign policy bucket and you focus on those other things, then there might all have been. I think that's changing now, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the build-up to G7, uh, the NATO, NATO summit. Um, uh, the various bilaterals we have this week, and all that shows that that you know the 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 the, the gears actually move quite effectively um, in that space in terms of delivery activity. It is much much harder in a in a COVID era when you can't travel, move around, or get very good IT. Um, so um, I, I don't want to be too critical. Actually, most of it is 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 pretty heartening. I just think where the where the deficit has been um, is, is is not always delivery or resource. It's 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 sometimes the thinking. Um, and the translation of the thinking into action, and sometimes in the areas of expertise. And I definitely think that that's not as rosy a picture, if I'm absolutely frank. No. And, and last question before, before I hand over to Jonathan. We've had a couple of uh, people in the audience who've asked about what role you see for industry in the uh, new world. Uh, you know, would, for example, you see secondees from industry coming into this to central sort of strategic function or, or is it more that industry in some way and if so how needs to be integrated better into the planning work for national security skills so i think everyone would agree that having more um industry and, and technological expertise is is a good thing uh, i don't think that in itself is not a is not a new idea um it, it is quite hard to find structures and and form for that that um um that, that is sufficiently um um that protects government against all the difficulties you have when you're when you're dealing with private business and industry um frankly and you can see different examples of that and i don't know what the answer to that is and others will be, will be you know at the sharper edge of that i think there's a massive question around procurement um uh, particularly in defense um i think they um um, impact of combination of Brexit and technological change um, with, you know, various conversations we're having internationally about uh, digital services tax, et cetera, or are changing the ecosystem um, rapidly and, and notably organizations like NATO are trying to kind of wrestle with the same challenges. Um, so I, I think, you know, the, the, the first thing you've got to have a sense of is, is how the topography and the, and the terrain of, of industry technology um, 
uh, your your defense industrial um, scientific base is changing as well. I mean, what you can clearly see in injury review and and, and the defense industrial strategy is a is a recognition without pushing it too far um, and and getting into terrain where the, the treasury wouldn't want me to be in. Um, that 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 is valued as 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 increasingly more important, um, and uh, that needn't be a kind of return to autarky or or um, you know the whole areas where you know for example the UK has um, um, you know genuinely world leading that awful phrase um, expertise, um, but there are other areas where you know we we have to rely on partnerships with allies. So the phrase we use in the review, which is which is my kind of favourite phrase, but, uh, I've not used it so much. It's been a cliche. Um, is co-creation, and I think that applies uh, across a range of uh, technologies, alliances, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I always think we're at the start of that conversation in the sense that everyone talks about um, supply chains, uh, supply chain resilience, et cetera. Um, it's quite hard to map that um, and deploy that. And again, you know, COVID forces you to do that in real time in many respects with, you know, vaccine procurement or PPE procurement. Um, it's quite hard to sort of plan um around that but that's why you do need planning um that's why you do need focus and resource that's why you need recognition that the, the, the market may not always fix it for you um so so that's a hopelessly vague answer um that just kind of admires the problem um but I, I, you know we do recognize the problem john thank you very much indeed again for your time which, which we all much appreciate and for the insights you've given us into the uh the the the, the genesis of the the, the review and the government's aspirations for the future. I think we all wish you and your colleagues well, because I think anyone who's read the review uh, knows that the, the really massive challenge is going to be turning that level of ambition into a detailed operational plan and then pursuing it through to a successful outcome. But uh, thank you again and uh, every good wish uh, for that work. Mm -hmm.